Thank you, Tim. I, I too appreciate the, uh, the standing for reading for God's word and the reverence for it. Uh, for those who need the translation, when Tim says he grew up in the high church, he doesn't mean like that kind of high, just <laughs> for preface in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's more of some of the more mainline denominations that have more of a, a structured gathering in a particular way. Uh, but that is a tradition that many of the churches do because we stand for the reverence of God's word because we believe that when God's word is read and when God's word is spoken, it is God himself speaking to us uh, through the different communicators and the different people that he has. And ultimately that God's spirit would work upon somebody's heart to give them eyes to see and ears to hear, to believe the things that are being taught on. And so that's, that's why we, are, we stood for the reading of God's word this morning for reverence of God's word. Uh, for those of you who are new here, uh, welcome. My name is Kyle, and I'm one of the pastors, and uh, I know I'm a little belated on this, but happy Thanksgiving. It is good to see you and good to be with you guys. I know some of you uh, have family and friends in town and brought them this morning, so uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us this morning on Sunday morning, um, and we are continuing on in our sermon series uh, through the book of Acts, and believe it or not, this is week 31, 31 weeks throughout the entire book of Acts. Uh, so if this is your first week, you have a little homework with this week. The first 30 are all online. You can go back and listen to them. Uh, you can go down and our, load our discipleship guides and study, and you can catch up and so you can ace the test next week. Um, just kidding, but if you did want to learn more about the book of Acts, all, everything is available online at someofyou.net. Uh, but starting next week, the month of December, we're turning our attention towards the Advent season. And the Advent season is one of longing and expectation. And Advent simply means coming. In the Old Testament, the saints and the people of God would long for the coming of the Messiah, coming of the, Mes the, the Savior, and they would look forward to the day in which that person would come. For us, fortunately, on this side of human history, we know that that person has come, and that person came as Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is that Messiah, that he is that Savior. So we don't necessarily look forward to his first coming, but we actually look forward to his return in which he will heal the world, and he will bring hope, he will bring peace, he'll bring love, he'll bring joy to, into its uttermost fulfillment when he returns. So we get to partner with kind of the Old Testament saints who are looking forward to the day of the Savior's coming. We join them in looking forward to his return, and that's what the season of Advent is all about, celebrating Jesus has come once before and acknowledging and knowing that he's coming once again. And what we're going to do this December season is, uh, if you're familiar, maybe if you've ever seen one of those Advent wreaths with the different candles, and each Sunday you light one to kind of represent an idea or a concept in which Jesus is that fulfillment of or Jesus is satisfies the longing for, and that's what we're going to be looking at. So the very first week, starting next week, we'll be looking at the idea of hope, how Jesus is our hope currently in this world, but also future in sentence in the way in which he will be that fulfillment of it. And then in the future weeks, we'll be looking at the ideas of peace, of joy, and the last week on Christmas Eve, we'll be looking at love. Uh, so you can see just the different topics uh, that we'll be covering. And then on Christmas Eve, uh, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, and so we'll have our normal Christmas Eve services during our regular scheduled, service, scheduled services at 9 and 11. Sometimes people are like, hey, what about an evening service or an afternoon service? We like coming that way. Uh, we're just going to host our morning services, 9 and 11, on Christmas Eve. And then if you want to uh, increase and do more worship and more study and more of those types of things with your family, we will be releasing a digital family devotion that afternoon that you can watch at home with your family, with your kids. Our kids and youth team are putting that together right now. And it's just another opportunity to help you kind of cultivate a love and uh, hope uh, for Jesus Christ in this season. One other thing that you'll notice uh, in our Advent series, uh, as Tim mentioned earlier, we do have, uh, we are one church with three locations throughout the Clark County area. We're here at Heritage Park. We have a location on the west side and a location up in Battleground. And in our Advent series, the different teachers, we're actually going to rotate around so you'll get an opportunity to meet uh, Kenan, our campus pastor over at the west side. You'll have a chance to meet John, our our campus pastor up at the Battleground campus, and I've been bragging about you guys to them for the last few seasons, the last few weeks of just how attentive you guys are on Sunday morning services, how you're all ears, and you're going to be showing up early, right? 11 o'clock service, you're going to show up early, maybe on time, okay, we'll, we'll go for that one, but we're, there, you guys will be here attentive, ready to listen, ready to engage, and welcome them to the Heritage Park campus this next December as they, they spend time with us. So, uh, that's where we're going in the month of December. Today we'll, we'll finish off Acts, so let's pray as we get started. Uh, Father, we give you thanks for today. 
and we give you thanks for the opportunity to gather this morning. Uh, we give you thanks uh, for just the good things that we experienced this week with the holiday, maybe some extra time off, uh, maybe some extra time with some family and friends, um, good meals, good conversations, and we give you thanks for those things. God, we also acknowledge that uh, the holiday seasons can be difficult because of different circumstances that we might be walking in. There might be one less person at the table this year. Uh, there might be strife in our family and our friends. So we, we pray that you would meet us in our needs and pray that as we turn our attention to your word this morning that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truth and the beauty of the gospel. And we pray that you would give us the faith to believe it. We pray this all in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. So 31 weeks in the book of Acts, and the book of Acts ends in a way that is quite surprising, maybe for some of us as we'll study it today. Now, the, the Wetzler household, we, we don't spend a lot of time watching movies because we have three small kids and ain't nobody got time for movies when you have three small kids, right? Unless it's like an animated film on a Friday night movie pizza night, right? But the rest of the time, we're not watching movies because as soon as the kids are in bed, I'm ready for bed, right? Parents, Amen. <laughs> That's all right. But there is one time of year that we, my, my wife and I, we actually, we, we break that a little bit and we watch movies and that's the Christmas season and the Christmas time. I think the only movies that we actually own and the movies that we will intentionally watch on purpose are Christmas movies. And there are different ones throughout the generations that have different things going on in it. But there's something specific about holiday movies that I like. It's that they have a conclusion and an ending and they have a nice little bow that wraps everything up for us. Right? There's no cliffhangers in Christmas movies, right? Bruce Willis survives every single year. Yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Santa always delivers presents on time. The family's always to get, like, Kevin isn't left home alone this Christmas. Like, it's, there's always a conclusion to the Christmas movie with no cliffhangers, no what ifs. We always have a neat little bow that just kind of delivers the final package at the end of the movie so we know how things end. I love that about Christmas movies. I love that when we have conclusions to a story that makes sense and that they, everything lines up great. But what's interesting as we turn our attention to Acts chapter 28 is that we actually receive the end of a story that's incomplete. The book of Acts, as we've been saying, that we've spent most of 2023 studying and we don't get the final bow on the package. It doesn't have this conclusion that kind of neatly summarizes everything. The very beginning of the beginning of the year, we, we picked out different verses to be memory verses, and one of them was Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it says this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so we've picked this verse to kind of be the main uh, guardrail, or not guardrail, but like the main line in which we're understanding and reading the book. You'll notice that our series was titled, You Will Be My Witnesses. Why? Because Jesus said to his disciples, we'll be his witnesses. And then when we studied chapters 1 through 7, we saw how God's people were his witnesses in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, we saw how they were witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And chapters 13, we've seen how the gospel has gone forth to the ends of the earth. So that outline has served us well as we've studied the book. And then we think about the ends of the earth and where we're at today and where we're at. And the way that Luke concludes this, this letter, this, this story of the yearly church uh, he leaves it open-ended for a reason to tell us that the story continues on. And that's the main idea, the main point that I have for us today is that the story continues on. And it'll be up on the screen for you and how we'll break down our text this morning. So the main idea is that the story continues on. We'll see it continues on in Malta in verses 1 through 10. The story continues on as Paul and his companions go to Rome in chapter 28 verses 11 through 15. We see the story continues on while he's in Rome in chapters 28, verses 16 through 31. And then lastly, as we'll wind down today, we'll see that the story continues with you. That the story continues with you. So let's turn our attention to Acts chapter 28. Verse 1 says this. After we were brought safely through, we learned that the island was called Malta. 
Now, if you were with us last week, you'll remember that Paul and his companions, 276 of them, were out uh, sailing the glorious Adriatic Sea in hopes of making their way to Rome from Caesarea, from the Israel Middle East area, heading over to Rome and to Italy. And what happened last week was a huge storm which caused the ship to what? Shipwreck. So isn't it a little ironic that the very first way that Luke would describe what happens next is that they were brought safely through? I don't know if that's necessarily how I would describe what took place. But we actually see it's a a promise fulfilled by God when he told Paul that everybody would make it through, everybody would make it through safely, that that's exactly what happened. And the the storm last week, we saw that they had to toss all their cargo over ship. They had to get rid of extra things on the ship that would make it navigating easier. We see at the end of the chapter that the the, the ship was broken up. People had to swim ashore. They all made it through the storm, maybe not in the way that they anticipated or the way that they wanted, but God had brought them through, and Luke can write, as he says this in verse 1, that they were brought safely through the storm, and we see that they bring to this island of Malta. Verse 2, it says this, the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and it was cold. Now, as we've journeyed through the book of Acts, we've noticed that whenever Paul came to a new place, he would seek out a synagogue to go teach at. He would go seek out brothers of the faith to have uh, interactions with and conversations with to receive hospitality. But when they came to this island, they discovered that there was nobody there that would have been considered a brother of the faith. There was no synagogue for Paul to go preach in. So they had to give themselves at will to whoever they would encounter on the island. And the way that Luke describes them in verse 2, it says that the native people... And the original translation, uh, many other uh, English translations would, instead of saying native people, would say barbarians. Now, there's a few reasons why they would use that term. First off, uh, in this time and in this place, if somebody didn't speak Greek, they were considered barbarians. So how many of you guys speak Greek? None of you. You are all barbarians. So you can now be considered barbarians. Congratulations. But the reason why they would often use that term is because it was describing somebody who was so unlike them, that didn't look like them, that didn't speak like them, that didn't interact like them, that would almost create um, this tension within the text, within the story of saying, what is going to happen to Paul and these individuals as they interact with these people on the island? Are they going to be hospitable? Are they going to be dangerous? Are they going to be unkind? These individuals are so unlike us. But what Paul and these criminals on the ship encountered were actually individuals who were quite kind, quite generous, quite hospitable. Now, this is the second time in two chapters that we've been shown individuals who didn't know who Jesus was and people who wouldn't consider themselves Christians, people who, who from all things considered, we wouldn't necessarily look at in a positive light. But Luke highlights within them the idea that they bear the image of God and they can still act and treat and respond to other individuals in the like kind. So the the, the passage begins to press upon us and nudge us along in our outreach not to distance ourselves from those who we consider native or distance ourselves from those who may we consider barbarians in our life, but actually see that even without that uh, confession of Christ in some of these individuals that they still are kind. They are still hospitable. They still have the image of God within them, so they have value, worth, and dignity, somebody to invest in, somebody to interact with, somebody to have a relationship with. And so Paul and this ship crashes aboard. They show hospitality, kindle a fire, and welcome them. And Paul, the apostle, writer of most of the New Testament, still sees himself as a servant to many, and he helps out with what's happening here, starting in verse 3. It says, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he had escaped the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up and suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So Paul makes it ashore, starts having this conversation, starts interacting with the people of the island. 
But he's fire, the fire's starting to go out, so he wants to serve. He goes out, collects bundles of wood, and throws this bundle of wood into the fire. And as the fire's heating up, a viper comes out and jumps up and attaches itself to his hand. And then this is where the Taylor Swift theology comes in. <laughs> he shook it off, right? The viper was on him, he shook it off, it fell into the fire, and nothing seemed to happen to him. And the native people were stunned what was taking place here. Now, if you've ever been in a meeting or a boardroom or a conversation with a group of friends or in a classroom, you know there's always that one instance that everybody notices something's wrong, but nobody wants to say anything, so everybody just kind of stands back and gives everybody the side eye, like, do you see what he did? See what they said? I could just see the, the, the people of the island waiting for something to happen to Paul, like, did you see what took place? But no such thing happened. No thing ill fell of Paul. Now, a few things reveal themselves about the human heart, I think, within this passage and within this interaction with Paul and the people on the island. The first one is the native people, the people of the island of Malta, are much like us, if we're honest. The very first interaction that they have with Paul is when he's shipwrecked and then he gets bit by a viper. They think, man, this guy must have had it coming to him. They have this sense of justice within inside of them because even if you notice in verse 4 where it says that justice has not allowed him to live, the J in your text most likely is capitalized because it's referencing to a false god in which they believed in of this, this cosmic karma type god who is going to balance out the scales. If you did bad, 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 God is going to strike you and balance the scales out. Now, we as Christians would say that that's, that's a silly thing to believe in, that's a foolish thing to believe in, but that's often how we approach our life, right? I've done so much bad, so this bad thing must have happened to me. Or that person's so bad, they have it coming to them. I can't wait to see them strike, God strike them dead. They, there's something inside of all of us that longs for justice to be served upon somebody who deserves it. And notice that the Maltese people were actually correct in their assessment of the Apostle Paul, because look at what they accuse him of in verse 4. They say, no doubt this man is a murderer. And you know what? They're right. They're absolutely right. As we saw in the beginning of the book of Acts, Paul was somebody who was a persecutor of the church, somebody who was trying to stomp out Christianity and oversaw and approved of the execution of innocent individuals, he, in fact, was a murderer. So in their worldview, they would be perfectly right to think that this man has it coming to him. But unfortunately, their worldview, that worldview and their worldview is not correct. Because the worldview of, of the gospel where, where Christ comes in is this, that though he deserves death for his crimes... Though he deserves eternal punishment for his crimes, Paul can boldly stand before them and say, I have been justified and made right with God because of what Christ has done on the cross for me. That he no longer has to stand due for the punishment that's coming for him for his sins and for his punishment because Christ has already taken that punishment for him. So you see their assessment of Paul was correct, but their understanding of what was coming to him was incorrect because they didn't know the story of Jesus Christ, that he has actually come to take the punishment for our sins, not just Paul's, but yours and mine as well. So Paul avoids shipwreck. He gets bitten by a poisonous stake. They think he's going to pass out. But the God of grace has intervened continually on Paul's behalf and saves him. The other thing that re this passage reveals about the human heart, I think, of, in the Maltese people that is also in us, of just how fickle they were towards the Apostle Paul, right? At first, they think this man's condemned, cursed, and, and damned by God. But then within just a few short verses later, they're like, well, he must be a God. Just how quickly our hearts want to demonize or criticize, or how quickly our hearts want to quickly then turn and worship something else. So Paul has this little interaction on Malta, and he continues on serving in this island as long as they're there, starting in verse 7. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. Think of how relieved Paul and his companions must have been at this point. They were just shipwrecked. Weeks before, they were on the sea with no food. Storms raging against them. Uncertainty of a future. But now entertained by the chief man of the island for three whole days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with a fever and dysentery. Paul visited him and prayed 
putting on his hands and healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly when we were about to sail. They put on board whatever we needed. These 10 verses are just fascinating to me because if we we go back in history and we look at it, at this time, as we saw that, there were no Christians on this island before Paul and these individuals came to the island, but he ministered to in such a way, meeting physical needs, and you know whenever he healed things, he always pointed and gave glory to God and then used it as an opportunity to teach people about Jesus, that he changed the the dynamic and the makeup and the, the demographic and the beliefs of this community and of this island. So much so to this day that the island of Malta still celebrates Paul hundreds and thousands of years later. Now, uh, there's even an area, if you were to go on your your Google Maps or if you were to pull up a a map later on, there's actually a section on the island of Malta that they call St. Paul's Bay. And this is where they, they suspect that they may have shipwrecked. And so there's this, there's St. Paul's Islands, there's these St. Paul's Bay. The whole area of Malta was transformed by Paul's three months that he spent on that island. So much so that they still celebrate Paul to this day. So on February 10th, every single year, it's National Shipwreck Day. So on February 10th this year, you have permission to celebrate a shipwreck. Now, they take it a little far. They they shoot off fireworks. Praise God, that's good. But then they take a statue of Paul and like parade him through the streets. I'm not saying that we do that. But they, but they celebrate the welcoming and the gospel message advancing to this little island still to this day and the amount of impact that Paul had on that island when he was just simply being who he was on his way to Rome of preaching the gospel, help ministering and caring for people's physical needs, and he left a lasting impact on that island. So February 10th, put it in your calendars, National Shipwreck Day. So the story continued on on Malta, and then now we see, starting in verse 11, the story continues on to Rome. Read with me in verse 11. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as figurehead. Putting it at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And there we made the circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Putulia. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they had heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Apius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. So up on the screen, you'll see a little map of what this journey looks like. So see on there is a little island of Malta where they put in at Syracuse, head up to Regium. The wind comes and pushes them up the Petuli, which is now the Bay of Naples. And they get out there, they still had about a 140-mile walk north all the way up to Rome. And so uh, Luke records a couple of details for us on this travel. He first off says that this ship had the twin heads or the two gods of Castor and Pollux on the front, which for that, at that time would have been people who had seen uh, worship being the Roman gods, Greco-Roman gods of protector of the ships, which is kind of silly because we all truly know who was protecting that ship and delivering Paul to Rome was the one true God. And so Paul arrives in Petulia, starts to walk up towards Rome, and it makes this comment that there's different brothers that receive them as well as other brothers who run out to greet them. And and it's really fascinating to me that there's those two things there. One, brothers to receive them, and then two, brothers running to greet them. For at this point, Paul had never made it to Rome. The book that we know of, the book of Romans, is a letter that Paul wrote to the church of Rome, but he wrote that about three years earlier. And so there's these individuals who are waiting to greet, ready to welcome, ready to show hospitality towards Paul, if and when he ever made it to Rome. It took three years from that letter being penned for this thing to actually happen. Consider this. Those men who ran to him from three taverns or the the forum would have traveled about 30 miles to greet Paul. Some of you get into our parking lot and can't even look your neighbors in the eye and greet you guys with good morning. I'm not asking you to run 30 miles to greet one another in the morning, although that might be a good thing for a greeting team in the morning, right? They could run out and greet you in the parking lot. That's a good idea, right, greeters? <laughs> They're shaking their head no. If you're a sprinter and a runner and you want to help greet, there's your new ministry opportunity right there. 
But they ran out to greet and welcome Paul. And what's crazy about this is not just the fact that they showed hospitality, that they loved one another, that they cared for one another, but it was actually an answer to Paul's prayer. Because if you were to even flip a page over in your Bible to Romans chapter 1, Paul writes this prayer talking about how he longs to see these brothers and sisters of the faith to be encouraged by them and to encourage them. And this is what he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 9 through 12. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So right here in Acts 28, we see an answer to God's, to Paul's prayer that he wrote out to God in Romans chapter 1. And I just think that's the most, one of the most beautiful things, that those things can just be back to back, page to page. That a prayer from an apostle, longing to see people, longing to be encouraged by one another, longing to serve one another, longing to minister to one another, just a page before in our pet Bibles, not chronologically, but on the page before, we see an answer to this prayer. And it, it should instruct us a little bit of just how much uh, this community of faith is necessary to be alongside one another, to sit with one another, to greet one another, to serve alongside one another. Of the benefit of it is what? Mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Even think about that. How, what, what, gave, what, what could Paul give thanks to God for? seeing brothers and sisters in the faith, and it gave him courage to know what he was about to go do. So never minimize or diminish your involvement and your engagement in the local body, your engagement with brothers and sisters in the faith. That it gives courage, that it gives encouragement. Just so you guys know, seeing you sitting here this morning is an encouragement to me. And I hope you seeing one another next to one another can be an encouragement to one of you as well to step into whatever God has for you next. And so we see now the story continues on in Rome, starting in verse 16. When we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. So this was like first century um, ankle monitor, Right? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever had to wear an ankle monitor because you're under house arrest. You know who you are. We know who you are too. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> not really. God knows. So this is like the first century low-grade uh, house arrest that he was actually chained, most likely, to a, to a guard. A tradition would say anywhere between every four to six hours, the guard that was chained to a prisoner would have been swapped out. So there would have been about three or four different individuals that Paul would have had an interaction with on the regular, daily. Could you imagine what those conversations must have looked like? Like Paul was probably always looking forward to the next guard, be like, I can't wait to share the gospel with somebody else today. Now, some of the guards would probably be like, I'm stoked. I'm going to be chained to Paul. I don't have to fear for my life. That dude's not going to want to fight me. The dude's not going to want to kill me. He's just going to want to talk to me about Jesus, whatever where other guards would have been like, not that guy again, I'd rather go fight for my life. But Paul, you definitely know, would have taken that opportunity to proclaim the gospel to whoever he was with. Verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the custom of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel I am wearing this chain. So Paul calls the local Jewish leaders of Rome at the time and calls them to come visit him again. He's under house arrest. He can't go anywhere. And he's saying, here's the reason why I'm here before you today, guys. I've been brought up on false charges of something that I, of think, there, I'm being accused of things that I've never done, things that I've never said. Uh, there's people who are wanting to persecute and challenge me, but there's no reason that I should be here before you today. If you've been studying with us this, this fall, you know the different charges that, or the different trials that he had before Festus and before Felix and before Agrippa, and nobody knew exactly what to do with him because they could never find him to be guilty of anything other than preaching about Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Paul says. It's like, I'm standing here before you today with no real charges before you other than the hope of Israel. 
Now, for him to say that, he's teasing out two ideas. One, he's trying to tell them that uh, the, I believe in the same things that you do, but I actually have an answer to the things that you're looking for. I, I, I know that the Messiah has come, that the one that we've been looking forward to to fulfill the promises of the Old Testament, the one that would bring salvation to our souls, that person has come. He'd also be saying when the hope of Israel of the resurrection, that the resurrection is real, that it's true, and that it has started because that Messiah who has come went into a grave but rose three days later, again, defeating sin, Satan, and death. He gave his spirit, and one day he will return. That's the reason why I'm in changes, because I've been preaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why I have these chains before you. And see, this is their response. Verse 21. And they said to him, we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here have reported or spoken any evil about you. So somehow Paul has made all his way to Rome from Caesarea, from the Middle East, from Israel area, to Rome in this time with no report of what he's done or what he said back to Rome. Even as on the journey that he took from Caesarea to Rome, there was no prosecuting attorney that went alongside him that they would be able to try his case in Rome. So they're saying, we haven't heard any of these things. We don't know exactly what it is that you're claiming and talking about. But they say in verse 22, we desire to hear from you what your views are for with regard to the sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. So they're saying, okay, Paul, we, we, we haven't heard why you're in chains. We don't know why exactly you're here, but you do mention this thing that we have heard about. We would like to hear more about that from you. And I can only imagine that Paul has a grin on his face thinking, I've been waiting for this opportunity to do just that. And so listen what Paul says next, or what happens next, verse 23. When they appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. So it wasn't just originally the Jewish leaders that came, it was also a whole mass more of people came to hear what this man would have to say. Verse 23, from morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. A few things that we can learn from just this one passage. For once again, I have biblical proof and biblical evidence that long sermons are okay. Paul preached from morning until evening. I just keep you from like first breakfast to second breakfast. You guys will be okay. We're not going to go that long. But we do see it as biblical proof that the text is open and explained at length to help us understand, to help us grow, to help us hear from the word of God. But then he also says that they, he tried to convince them from the law of Moses and the prophets. Meaning all of what we have in the Old Testament, Paul was systematically walking through and teaching to this group of individuals, trying to help them not just simply gain new information, but to experience transformation and experience growth spiritually and a change of position before God. Paul must have been talking about that Jesus was the Messiah, that there is a resurrection of the dead, that salvation has come and it is coming through Jesus Christ, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. It comes through faith in Jesus' name. You know he would have been talking about turning and repenting from their sin, asking them to change their mind about God and who he is and what he's done and how to have right relationship with him. He would have told them about how to receive forgiveness of sins, that their their sins were scarlet, now they're going to be white as snow because of the work that Christ has done on the cross. You know that he would have opened their minds up to the idea of Genesis 3.15, where the first promise of the gospel comes when it says that this seed will come from Eve that will crush the serpent's head. That right there, he's saying, guys, that's Jesus Christ. He would have taken them to the story of Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15 of this, this old couple that was barren and he's made, how God made this promise to this couple to say, through your seed, I will bless the world. Many nations will come from you. Your offspring will outnumber the stars in the sky. And this old man's thinking, what are you talking about? The seed that came from that old couple is a promise from Christ. Christ comes through that line. You know he would have opened up up their their minds and their their understanding to the the whole sacrificial system that we see within the Old Testament, specifically about the Day of Atonement, if you think about it in in Leviticus, Leviticus 16, how people would bring two goats to the temple, one to be sacrificed that the sins would be slaughtered, the goat would be slaughtered for the sins of the people, and the other goat would be taken out into the hills and be set free because that goat would take the sins away. Paul would have been saying, like, Jesus Christ is the true fulfillment of the atonement. 
that he is the one that is coming and doing both those things. His blood was shed for the forgiveness of your sins, but he also removes your sins and takes them away from you as far as the east is from the west. You know, Paul would have spent time talking about, in Joel chapter 2, how one day the Spirit would come and fall upon men and women and allow them to prophesy and use their gifts and evangelize and tell the world. He would have said, that day has come. The Spirit has descended because Christ has come already. You know, he would have taken time to open up the words of the prophet Isaiah where he talked about how there was a virgin to come with a child. The one that we celebrate at Christmas time. That, that, that child has been born. That child has been given unto us. He would have spent great time at length explaining how Jesus Christ is the one that they've been looking for. How Jesus Christ is the only one who has come to set them free from their sin. He would have talked about how Moses led his people out of Egypt and out of slavery. He would have said Jesus leads us out of bondage and slavery to our sin. Far greater of a taskmaster than Pharaoh ever could be. And look at what it says in there, verse, verse 23. It says that he talked to them from the law and prophets and trying to do what? Trying to convince them. He wasn't just simply trying to introduce new ideas to them. He wasn't just trying to simply entertain them for a little bit of time. He was trying to convince them to go from point of disbelief to belief in Christ. And you know what? That's exactly what we do here. That's exactly why we gather on Sunday morning. That's exactly why we come together and open up the scriptures that whoever's up here, whoever has the scriptures open, that we would try to convince you about Jesus Christ. Now, I know for some people that can be off-putting that we, we feel like we have an agenda or something that we're trying to do, but that's exactly the charge that God has given us to do. To convince you that Christ is real. That life with him is satisfying and fulfilling. That turning to other things and other gods and other people will only leave you dissatisfied and heartbroken. The reason why we gather week in and week out is try to convince you that Christ is enough. We're not just here to transfer ideas to you or entertain you. Paul was serious about having these individuals knowing and loving Jesus, and we too at Summit View Church, me, myself, am passionate about knowing that you would know and love Jesus Christ. And look at the response that Paul receives in verse 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. Now this seems to be a pattern as we study the book of Acts together. Anytime that the gospel is preached and proclaimed to a group of people, some respond receiving it, turning towards God, repenting from sin and turning to him, giving up old ways of life, pursuing a life of faith in Christ, seeking to live obediently, seeking to figure out what it means to, uh, to live a life to honor God, knowing that we don't get it perfectly every single day, but at least the commitment to go that right direction yet some disbelieve. So that happens every single time as we've opened up the book of Acts, but the other thing is that I just want us to be aware of is that the same thing happens today. Every single Sunday that we gather together to open up the scriptures, there are going to be people who come into our doors that don't believe in Jesus. And you know what? I'm glad they're here. There's probably some here this morning, and I'm glad that you're here. This place is for you. We're glad for you to explore the scriptures with us. We are glad that you're here. And again, the goal for us out of this is to convince you that Jesus is worth following, that Jesus is love enough and Jesus is worth loving. But we know that sometimes that doesn't happen in a moment. It doesn't happen in an instance. There will be other people who will walk out of here disbelieving. And that happens every single Sunday here. And for those of you who call some of you home and are here week in and after week, I just want to remind you of that, that oftentimes we have visitors and guests joining us on a Sunday who don't believe and will leave disbelieving, so we, that's why we pray. In fact, there's, a, there, there's very specific reasons why we pray the way that we do as we study the passage a little bit further. But we see when the gospel message is proclaimed based upon what it says in verse 24, some will believe and others will disbelieve. That there's, it's not a, there's not a third way. You're either going to believe or you'll disbelieve. And this passage kind of alludes to the fact that indifference towards Christ actually shows it's unbelief, not belief. And so Paul makes this statement and it says, this is what hung people up the most, starting in verse 25. 
and disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their eyes can barely hear. Their eyes have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. So Paul winds down his argument with these leaders and these individuals of this day saying that this whole thing has been prophesied from old that some of you are just going to reject this. Some of you aren't going to hear this. Some of it, you'll see it right before your eyes and you still won't see it and you still won't believe it. And so that's why every single Sunday for most weeks when we come here and as we gathered and pray before we open the scriptures, we're praying that, God, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to believe? Because I would hate for the fact for us to become so familiar and so okay with the gospel, maybe in front of our eyes and maybe right our ears, but we still clog it out and we still don't have eyes to see it and we still have hard hearts to not receive it. But the scriptures prophesy that this would happen with the, the people of Israel at that time, that they would actually just have the Messiah right in front of their face and completely not see it. May that not be said about us. And so Paul uses this, this quote from the prophet Isaiah, draws out of chapter 6, and it's the only text that's quoted in every single gospel. Jesus uses this passage to describe his message and to describe his ministry, and Paul simply picks up on it. Isaiah had a ministry to Israel despite being hardened, despite them having eyes and not seeing having ears but not hearing. So Paul draws the same claim and um, says the similar type of thing is happening here with these individuals. So verse 28, Paul essentially says, because of your rejection, I'm taking this gospel message to the Gentiles, which is most of us because we're not ethnically Jewish. And we praise God for Paul bringing that message to the Gentiles. And we see now Paul kind of take a little bit of a turn and start to close the book. Verse 30, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And the book ends there. So we see the story continued on with Paul as he was in Malta. The story continued on as he made his way to Rome. We saw the story continue on as he was in Rome. And the book of Acts ends with this idea that the story continues on with you. You see, Paul, during these two years in prison, would have written the book of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But we're not told what happens next for him, right? Feels a little anticlimactic, like, Kyle, you've been building up week 31 for weeks, and this is how the book ends? We spent all this time to study of how Paul gets to Rome, how Paul has to stand before Caesar, and we never get to see how that plays out. All we simply know is that the word of God has made it to Rome and people are beginning to believe. Yes. Tradition would tell us that Paul would be released in a couple years. He would preach a bit more. He would be rearrested and eventually persecuted and killed in AD 65 where a guard would take his sword and cut his head off. But even without that in the scripture, how this book ends should give us great courage and confidence to go forward. For one, once again, we're reminded that men and women of God may be chained, but the gospel cannot be contained. Because notice how it says that in verse 30 and 31. He lived there for two more years. He was in chains. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. Paul couldn't go anywhere but the gospel and the word of God still continue to go forth, right? That people may bind preachers and teachers, but the gospel cannot be chained and contained because the story continues on with you. As we've studied the book of Acts, we've seen that the word of God has successfully made it from Jerusalem to Judea and to Samaria, and now it's beginning to touch the ends of the world, which started off as a small movement in Judea has now moved it to a distant province, to now a worldwide religion. 
This open ending to the book of Acts means it's an open ending into our ministry of the church. Things just didn't stop there. The gospel went forth from Rome and covered all throughout Italy, then it made its way into Europe. Eventually, it made its way to North America, and somehow, by God's grace, it made it to a little corner of the Pacific Northwest, Vancouver, Washington, where we gather this morning. The story continues on. And so what I want to do is, as we close, is pray for us. This would be a prayer of commissioning, that we would see that the story of commissioning goes on with you and I today, that we get to carry on in this legacy, in this history, of what God had begun a work doing all the way back in Acts chapter 1, still to us today. Because if you've been with us this entire year as we've been studying this book, we know that the same gospel that's preached in Acts chapter 2 is the same one that was preached in Acts chapter 28, and it's the same one that we preached here this morning. We know the same results that happened at the beginning of Acts where some accepting it happened there in Acts 28. It happens here today still. The act of some rejecting it back then still happens then and happens today still. We know we studied the book of Acts in chapter 1 that Christ was at work building his church. He was doing it in Acts chapter 28, and he continues to do that work today through you and I. So as we close, let me pray for us that God would continue to do this work in our lives and in our church, that we too would experience the story continuing on in some of you, church. Let me pray for us. Father, we come before you today, gathered as your body, as your church, inspired by the stories of the early church and the book of Acts. We are filled with awe and gratitude for the boldness and the unity and love that characterizes the lives of the apostles and the followers we see. We pray that you would ignite within us the same spirit of power, love, and self-discipline that the early church exhibited. May we be filled with the Holy Spirit just as the disciples were on the day of Pentecost, and may we speak with boldness and clarity about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for unity amongst us, just as the early church was united in their devotion to you and one another. May we set aside our differences and embrace our common calling as your children. May we love one another as you love us, with compassion, forgiveness, and understanding. We pray for a heart of service, just as the early church was known for their care for the needy. May we be moved to compassion to reach out to those in need, both within our congregation and in our community. We pray for the same spirit of generosity that characterized the early believers. May we be a community that cares for one another, sharing our resources and talents to meet the needs of those around us. We lift up our leaders just as the early church did. Would you grant them wisdom and discernment, the strength to lead with humility and grace. May they be guided by your spirit in every decision they make. We pray for perseverance in the face of adversity just as the early church faced persecution and hardship for their faith. May we stand firm in our beliefs even when faced with opposition. May we not be swayed by fear or intimidation but may we continue to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray for growth in our faith just as the early church grew in number and boldness and strength. May we be committed to deepening our understanding of your word and our relationship with you. May we be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of your word. We pray for the spread of the gospel just as the early church spread the message of salvation to all corners of the known world. May we be a part of your mission to reach people with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. May we use our gifts and talents to share your love with others. 
God, we thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. We pray that you would continue to guide and empower us as we strive to be a church that reflects the teachings and values of Jesus Christ. And would you help us to be your witnesses in the places you've sent us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we have a, a few ways to respond to the message that we've heard. One is that we do every single week, and that's the act of communion. In it, we are reminded of the body, and the, the body of Christ that was broken for us, and the blood of Christ that was shed for us to bring the forgiveness of sins. So this is an act as believers that we take with great confidence, knowing that we were once far off, but have been brought near because of what Christ has done for us. That much of the accusations that the world could throw against us may in fact be true, but because of what Christ has done on the cross for us, we no longer have to face the punishment for. So as Christians, we get to come to the table with joy, celebrating the fact that we have been brought near towards God by what Christ has done for us on the cross. That's what we're reminded when we take the elements. So if you're with us this morning and you want to consider yourself a Christian, this is the one act of our gathering that we would ask you to not partake in, for it is an act of worship and declaration that Christ's death is enough for our sins. There will be a prompting up on the screen for you to read over and consider your faith, but maybe today you're at that point of maybe wanting to come to faith, confess Christ. And there's a few ways that you could respond to that. You could come to the table and talk with one of the leaders that is there. They would love to explain to you what it is. Or we also have people in the corners that would love to pray with you and speak with you if you're wondering what it means and what it looks like to come to Christ. So that is the way that we get to respond today. We come to the table as recipients, and then we leave the tables as witnesses for what Christ has done for us. And after that, we will stand and worship and declare just how good our God is. So when you're ready, you may make your way to the table.